All right, so before we move on to chapter six, um, first I want to go over what we already talked about for chapter five. And then there's this one little aside thing that he mentions about horses. Um, so we'll, we'll discuss that pretty shortly. Um, but first, I want you to answer this question. Why can't temptation compel or enslave the will? Uh, so take a minute or so and write something down. Write down an answer. According to Anselm, why can't temptation compel or enslave the will? Yeah. Okay, so the will is inclined towards the good in general. So now, something worth noting there, um, and this is, he talks about this on the first, in the first dialogue on truth. Um, so if you read that, some of this is going to be familiar. So um, when we talk about the will being inclined towards truth, depends what we mean by truth here. Um, truth, the truth of the will is rectitude. So for, uh, in the context of the will, that's doing the right thing. That's doing good. So, uh, and again, for a little bit of context here, the reason he comes up with that, uh, if you haven't read on truth, the reason he comes up with that uh, has to do with the transcendentals. So we talked about transcendental qualities back when we were talking about uh, Anselm the last time. Uh, and then we brought it up again when we were talking about Aquinas. Uh, transcendental qualities are qualities which are convertible with being. So being considered in a certain way. Uh, so being considered intellectually, right? So considered as an object of the intellect is truth. Being considered as an object of the will is good. And so good and truth are really the same thing. It's just the good is the truth of the will or truth is, is the good of the intellect, something like that. So why does that make it so that temptation can't compel the will? So temptation being something less than optimal or less than good, right? It still seems desirable. The will is always oriented towards the good. Okay. It's Naturally speaking, yes. But because it's it's because the will acts spontaneously and not just naturally, the will can still choose not to choose the good, right? So why is it that when, for example, when you choose to do something suboptimal, or you choose to do something wrong, or you choose to sin, how is it that we say that that's your choice, it's your fault, it's not temptation or wrong compelling you? Because we know the truth. I guess we don't know the truth, but Well, if you know the truth, then you... So it comes down, does anyone have something different from this, first of all? Because you've got, you've got a solid element of it, but it's only part. Does anyone else have something, have a different answer to this question? I feel like it has something to do with the affection. Yes. So it has something to do with, with different affections of the will, rather than just the instrument itself. And it has to do with the relationship of these things to each other, just like everything we've talked about so far. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean... Temptation doesn't change your affection. It, so, it does change your affection. But, I don't know why it does... It's, is this timed to just turn off every day at 1227 or something? 1237 or something? Anyway, sorry. So, the affection is what is changed by temptation, right? So, when you're tempted to something, when you want to do something but kind of don't want to do something at the same time, so, thinking of an example, Black Friday was less than a week ago. Uh, was anyone tempted by anything on Black Friday? Sure. Or, I mean, I'm not going to put it past anyone, but to buy, to steal, whatever. Or to, to beat someone up for, yeah, for getting in front of the line, or whatever. And whatever the case may be. Was anyone tempted on Black Friday? Yes. Yeah. All right, you wanted a new TV. What happened? Um, I lacked the instrument, which is money. Yeah. And I didn't. 
Okay, so you had something like the affection for it. You knew how to acquire it. You wanted it, but you couldn't get it. So that's something that we would hard we would that Anselm would hesitate to call a temptation. Because temptation is something that's within your grasp. You can get it. Then the choice is whether you are going to or not. So is anybody looking at anything that you thought? Now, setting aside the question of can you afford it, I want to ask the question, could you buy it? Is, was it possible to acquire it? I could have bought it, yes. You could have. Why not? Or didn't you? You would have been able to eat. Yeah, I would have. Well, <laughs> okay, so, so why were you tempted though? Knowing that you couldn't afford it, knowing that the money in your pocket was, was more valuable to you, or in other words, that other things you could have purchased with that money were more valuable, why were you still tempted? I just loved huge TVs. You love huge TVs. What about it? What, 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 what makes a huge TV so appealing? can see things clearly, right? We don't have the problem like with D2L on, on when, you're, when you're watching the game. Right, so you have a temptation which illuminates certain aspects of something, right? So when you were tempted to buy the new TV or whatever it was that anyone here was tempted by on Black Friday or whenever, what happened, what changes is something like what you perceive about the thing. So when you perceive this nice, new, big screen TV, you're thinking that it's nice, it's new, and it's big. Right? That's the temptation. The temptation isn't, man, this is gonna cost me all the money I need to buy food this week. That's not what's going through your mind because if that's what's going through your mind, you're not tempted, you're choosing not to buy it. Because when you chose not to buy it, that's what you focused on, right? You thought, I really can't afford this. So what goes on here, why the will can't be compelled? Well, first of all, we can just demonstrate it. Your will was not compelled to purchase the TV because you could have and because you wanted to. You could still choose not to. But if I had the money, if I had the instrument, mm -hmm. my will would have, or the, the temptation would have changed my will. Right? But you did. You had a credit card. You could have swiped it and walked home with the TV, there was right? secondary long-lasting consequences. Like, uh -huh. In the moment, I knew I had the $700 to buy a brand new TV. And I was yep. like, and I would still be able to eat, still be able to get anything I you know, wanted. Mm -hmm. I'd call it gas, cars, whatever. Yep. So I probably would have done it. So the difference is, so I want to draw out a difference here between, between the instrument, strictly speaking, and affections for other things. So if you have, let's use green, because, well, let's use blue because it works, I think. All right. So if you have different affections for something, so if you have an affection for the TV, right? But you also have an affection for food, and et cetera. Right. Things that you need. What's happening here is not that you don't have the instrument. Right? It's not that you're not capable of choosing to buy the TV, right? What's happening here is that you have competing affections. You have different things that you want or different things that your will is inclined to. And because of that, you're not being compelled to choose the TV. Now, what if you no longer need to worry about food or other expenses. Right? Somebody offers to, to free of charge, no strings attached, pay for all of your food, housing, transportation, all of your needs, and you still have the money that you could otherwise spend on the TV. Now what? Now what are you going to do? Buy Right. Why? There's no reason not to have no reason not to. Right. There's no competing affections. You have one affection, in the moment at least. There's one thing that you want. You have the instrument. You're capable of getting it. So and that, so you do. So does that mean temptation can compel 
It's not well. See, here we go. Is in that case, in that case, yes. So in that case, it's not temptation because you only want one thing. There's only one thing. You you have one affection. So in that case, me getting this TV is my will. Yeah, right. It's your will because the instrument is aligning with the affection. Right? You have the instrument for it. You want it. It's the only thing you want. Your will isn't being drawn in any different direction. So your will is exercised. So you buy it. Right? So that's what happens. Now, why this is relevant and why I erased one of these is we only really have the problem when there are competing affections. Right? So when we also have the, the temptation or it's not quite the right term. So when we have the affection for food, shelter, transportation, things we need, or even instead of buying a TV, um, is there something, if somebody had $700 on Black Friday, would anyone have bought something else? What? New phone. New phone, great. So new TV or new phone? We also have lots of other affections competing for our limited resources. Maybe you can just even say, uh, maybe even if uh, all this is taken care of, maybe just money. Maybe you like having money in your pocket. Whether that's out of some, whether that's some out of some inordinate desire to possess money itself, or it's you know for something that's relatively sensible, like having the security to be able to pay for unexpected expenses, that kind of thing, whatever. Right? There's a benefit to just having that, to having that ability, having that power. Why I erased one of these is to illustrate Anselm's point. Anselm's point here is that what happens when you enslave your will to temptation is you eliminate options. You suppress certain affections in favor of others. So what you're doing when you choose to buy the new TV is you're eliminating your desire for money, right? Because you're giving it up. You're handing over $700 or your credit card or whatever in exchange for the TV. You're also dismissing or eliminating your affection for basic necessities, food and stuff. Whether that's because it's already paid for or because you're just not thinking about it, you're suppressing that affection. Same with a desire for a new phone. You're putting that affection away. You're saying, no, I don't want this. You're suppressing it. You no longer want it in comparison to the thing that you do want. So what you're doing is, rather than temptation compelling you or actively enslaving you, what you're doing is you're eliminating other options. You're enslaving your own will by eliminating all the options except for an affection. So you just turn the, you get rid of all the temptations and turn it over to your will. So the temptation influences your affections and your affection enslaves No, your will enslaves itself to an affection. And if that's, that affection can be for something that's a temptation, that can be for something useful, that can be for something good. But the point is that it's always going to be the will which inclines itself, it chooses something, in this case, right, a TV, rather than something else. And when it chooses something rather than something else, what it's doing is it's eliminating other affections. It's ruling other things out, so it's limiting itself. Now, if the will is inclined to the good, the good as such, and so if, if the will is upright, or if the will has rectitude, to use the sort of awkward translation, what that means is we're not talking about affection for the TV. We're talking about affection for the good, no matter what aspect it happens to fall under, right? So a TV is good for some things, food is good for other things. The question then becomes, which is more beneficial for me in the long run, or now, or in general? 
So that's how an upright will will make its decision. So an upright uh, will in possession of rectitude will make a decision based on what is the best option. Giving in to temptation is eliminating other options. You're constraining your own will. You're constraining what the instrument can be used for, what the instrument can exercise, by limiting what affections it's inclined towards. So, $700 for a new TV. Something else that you could have done with the $700 is waited till Tuesday, giving Tuesday. I guess that's a thing now. Donated it to somebody who needs it more. That's probably, well, that may be, right, assuming you don't have immediate material needs, right, that may be the, the right thing to do. And assuming that it is, well, why would you buy a TV? Yeah, so it might benefit you more, but is it overall the better thing to do? Oh, yeah. That's the question. So if you recognize that giving $700 to someone so they don't starve is a better thing to do with $700 than buying a new TV, if you recognize that, the only reason to buy the new TV is if you take that option off the table. Right? If, you, if you suppress the, say, affection for charity, the affection for helping others, that kind of thing. And that is the will abandoning rectitude. That is the will making it so it cannot be inclined to the good as such, or the good in general, and is instead inclined to particular things. So that is in essence, what we're talking about here. That's why temptation of itself can't compel the will, but the will can enslave itself to temptation. The will can choose to put certain affections off the table and so make it so that certain less than optimal options, in other words, certain sins, are the only things that it can choose from. It's the will putting itself into a trolley scenario or putting itself into the scenario we were talking about, about like avoiding death by lying, that kind of thing. All right. Well, okay, so one other little thing that he points out, which has to do with this, this kind of interplay between the will, so the instrument of the will and the affections, uh, is down here where he talks about the difference between uh, a human making a choice and a horse making a choice. Um, so the student asks, can we by similar argument say that the will of a horse is free since it willingly serves the bodily appetite? So animals, are, are, are non-rational animals free in the same sense? Thoughts? So are non-rational animals free in the same sense because their will is, is inclined towards natural goods? Um, how does he say it? Uh, bodily appetites. Yes. Yeah. Are you sure? Maybe. So, so this is something like uh, the idea that, you know, well, if we were in a Natu a natural, unsecure environment, we would focus on those things. It's kind yeah. of a Maslow's hierarchy kind of idea. But I mean, given if the horse, if there's a starving horse here and a non starving horse here, the non starving horse is going to give up his hay to give it to the starving horse. He's going to do the best for him, just like he would with the TV. It's different objects, but it's the same principle. So that's a critical difference. And that makes the difference between whether the horse is free or not. Because what did we say about, let's say, giving into temptation? When we give into temptation, what is the will doing? Yes. So it's less free. So the horse, the well-fed horse, to use your example, which I think is great, the well-fed horse, the one who's maybe a little hungry, but not really, the one who has a bucket, in a bucket of food in front of him, 
he's going to shove the starving one out of the way to get to the food. Right? Just like you might shove someone out of the way to get to the new television. Right? It happens. The person's will, when they do that, is constrained. It's unfree. It's ruled by temptation rather than the good. It's ruled by the desire for a particular object in the moment rather than the good in general. Ansel means to point out that the horse is always like that. Non-rational wills are always directed towards whatever object happens to seem good to them. They can't abstract away and conceptualize the good as such, or the good in general, or even which good will be better overall or in the long run. This is why, this is why animals, like non-rational animals, not humans, don't, um, don't plan for the future. They don't save. They don't invest in the future, that kind of thing. That's a uniquely human thing because we're capable of, of abstracting from the present into the future. What looks like an exception to this, like squirrels, for example, isn't quite. Because if you actually watch what squirrels do, they'll bury nuts. Right? They bury acorns or whatever for, for the winter, for when there aren't acorns. However, if you actually watch squirrels, and, like, um, and uh, zoologists have, have studied these kinds of things because it's actually interesting, uh, surprisingly interesting, that if you watch a squirrel bury acorns, they don't come back for them. Really, they don't. Um, what they do is they, they've had a lot to eat, and then what they'll do is they'll bury acorns on the assumption that later on there will be acorns under the ground. So what happens is come winter, when there aren't acorns laying all over, squirrels will dig and they will find acorns. They will usually not find the acorns that they buried. This is actually pretty much essential to the propagation of oak trees. Squirrels forgetting where they buried acorns. Interesting bit of coevolution. But more interesting is the fact that even, even squirrels who we think of as you know, squirreling things away for the future, right, we even use that in terms of like for human savings, that's not what they're doing. What they're doing is they are putting aside something that they do not need now and finding something later. Unrelated. More or less. Because right? if it's related, it would be something like... But is that purposeful? Are they purposely just like, here's an acorn, I'll take an acorn later? Or is it, I'm going to dig right here because I know my acorn is here. Really yeah, they don't do that. Right. So, based on scientific observation, we see squirrels digging holes and putting acorns in them and not coming back to them. But digging elsewhere. Yeah. What about dogs? They bury bones and stuff? They often don't find them. Yeah, that's another thing. They often, often if a dog buries something, like the only time you'll find it is if your kid is digging in the backyard or something. Yeah, uh, or... Actually, this is why a lot of things get buried in like domestic neighborhoods, like when you're digging for a pool or something. It was fine stuff that your dog buried because your dog buried it for later and then didn't plan ahead because they're not capable of planning ahead. Right? That's not something that that uh, a non-rational mind is capable of um, capable of abstracting. So what happens in a case like that is that the What they're doing is they are choosing right now to keep something safe. To prevent, for example, the squirrel is trying to prevent that other squirrel from getting its nut. So it buries it. What he does later is, oh, I know there's nuts buried under the ground. So I'm going to dig for them. And they find a nut. So these are two disconnected processes that happen. So. Part of the point here is that between the will and the object, right? so the will meaning the instrument, and the object, the thing that it wants, the thing it has the affection for, in exercising it, a rational will, or in other words, a human will, can act 
and can pursue the object, can choose not to, or can choose to put forward any amount of effort in between not achieving it and achieving it. So we have this thing that we do where we try not very hard to get something. But it's not something you find in animals. Uh, except in play. Like if animals play, like a lot of mammals will play, then that's a case where you'll find it. But in most cases, in terms of actually trying to get something, trying to acquire something, you will not find an animal other than human beings who will try but not hard enough. An irrational animal will always, if they have an affection for an object, will always exercise that effect, exercise their will to achieve it. If there's an affection present for some object, they're going to try and get it. That's true, right? So you can you can train your dog to not get a treat right now. So you can even, like, if you put a treat on a dog's yeah. nose who's really well trained, you can tell him to wait. Why you can do that is because the dog, I hate to say understands, but under, understands in a limited sense that that's how it gets treats. Right? So that's what it needs to do in order to achieve that end. Yeah, they make associations. Yeah, so yeah. Right. Or putting their butt on the ground when you say sit. Yeah. Right. So, it's, so it's more of an associative thing rather than, well, here are some options of things that I can acquire. Which one am I going to pursue? Because then, if that were the case, then there would be no really, there would really be no such thing as a well-trained dog because then the dog can just choose spontaneously between, you know what, I feel like a treat, the master's not home, so I'm going to go up on the counter. Sometimes that happens, but it's usually you'll find that in the same dogs who will not wait for a treat if you offer it to them. And it's because they, they haven't developed this association yet. Whereas if they have developed the association, that's just how they exercise their will. That, that's all there winds up being to it. Okay. All right. Finally done with chapter five, I think, unless we have stuff to go back over here. So we move on to chapter six. In what way our will is powerful against temptations, even though it seems weak? So I'm going to scroll down a bit more. Here we go. So it seems like the will is weak in the face of temptation. It seems like the will can be swayed towards things. And he's especially here talking about when we have limited the will, right? when we've given in to temptation already. Because he uses this example of, uh, to go back to the example from last time, of choosing between, on the one hand, or, let me put it the other way. The threat of death versus lying to get out of it. So the temptation here, again, uh, we're assuming from the outset that lying is always wrong. Right? So we can just set that aside whether that's the case. We can assume for the sake of argument that lying is always wrong. We're tempted to lie to avoid death. So the teacher here responds to something the student says. Uh, to do with this issue. It says, for if a human being wills to lie in order to avoid death and preserve his life for a time, who will say that it is impossible for him to will not to lie in order to avoid eternal death and live forever? What's he saying? Choosing the easier route. Okay. Are you, though? Is that the easier route? The easier route is short-term lying for short-term more life. Okay, so it's short-term thinking. Yeah. Never lying for eternal life. Okay, something else? Yeah, I think he's saying to what we were saying the other day that sometimes you have no choice. I think he's saying like, you do have a choice and you can 
choose not to lie for actually a good and good thing, just dying for a time. Yeah, so there is really a choice here. It seems like, you know, oh, I had no choice but to lie because I would have died otherwise. Okay, sure, but it was a choice, right? You had two options. What temptation does is it describes the options in a certain way, right? Death sounds bad. Getting out of dying sounds good. So let's get out of dying. That's temptation. Another way of describing this is preserving rectitude versus not. So we can just describe this in a different way. Right? So he says, he uses the example here, he uses the comparison of, um, so rather than, so choosing not to lie, right? so choosing temporal death is eternal life. So he's assuming do right, get into heaven. Right? But it goes a little deeper than that. Because what he's talking about here is preserving rectitude. It's not just talking about you know, getting into heaven or whatever rewards that might, that might entail. He's, in, he's talking about doing the right thing and avoiding doing the wrong thing. And doing the right thing is good, right? And that's what the will is oriented towards. That's what the will is directed towards. It's directed towards the good. So what the temptation says is, hey, this is good because it avoids this. What another way of looking at it will say is, well, well no, it's not. That's, that's abandoning rectitude. That's abandoning your will for the good, your affection for the good. So, yeah, go ahead. Do you not think that like, allowing someone to kill you is sin? Like, allowing someone to kill you is sin? So it can, can depend on the context. Allowing someone to kill you if you have no... If the only way of avoiding it... Well, okay, so... Straightforwardly enough, allowing someone to kill you is not a sin. However, pursuing death actively is. So this actually comes up with, oh, what was that? I forget what the group was. This was a, an early group of, of um, sort of heretical Christians uh, in somewhere in North Africa. Uh, and they did this thing where uh, because they, they got this idea in their head that martyrdom was a virtue, right? It's good to be martyred. And so what they would do is they would, they would get, like, clubs and, like, blunt weapons, and they would attack caravans and start beating people. And then, naturally, the people who are guarding the caravans would kill them. And they would say some kind of pious phrase to say, oh, well, this is, this is, this is for Christ. And they would beat people with the hopes of getting themselves killed. That's not martyrdom. Right? That's pursuing being killed. Right? So that's choosing to be killed when other options are, are obviously available. In a case like this, when your options are fully constrained, again, what's, what's involuntary about it, what's bad about the situation is having gotten yourself into the situation in the first place. So we would say that you have a moral obligation to avoid situations like that if it's possible. And I think Ansel might kind of be trapped into saying that it has to be possible to avoid those situations. He's not explicit about that. But I think you can make a pretty strong argument that, that he kind of has to say that if you get yourself into a no-win situation, you have to have gotten yourself into it. It has to have been your fault somewhere along the line. So, so that's a little, a little bit tricky. But... Yeah, so he doesn't want to say that, right? So again, if the if if the choice is between if the choice is between doing something objectively wrong uh, and getting yourself killed, you, you should. Here he's saying you should get yourself killed instead of doing the thing that's objectively wrong, or maybe not get yourself killed. Allow yourself to be killed. Right? If the only way of avoiding it is by doing something gravely sinful, then don't. So you're not actively pursuing death, right? right. You know what's what's coming, you know you're going to die. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's troublesome. And the reason it's troublesome is because 
we're in that situation unwillingly, uh, like he was talking about in the previous chapter. Right? No one would willingly put themselves into that situation. And if you would, you'd be wrong to do so. Like the, you know, like the, the I forget what the, what the group was called. I, I wish I could remember. Um, but the, one who, uh, the, the ones who would attack people with the hopes of being, quote, martyred, right? Getting yourself voluntarily into that situation is wrong. However, if you are in that situation, there may not be a, an optimal choice, but you should avoid doing the thing which is always wrong in all circumstances, which is what he's assuming about lying. Because if you choose not to lie, what you're choosing is to preserve rectitude of the will. So what you're doing is you're choosing the good, and further, you're choosing not to enslave yourself to sin or to temptation or enslave yourself to something less than optimal, something that isn't good. So you die, but you die free, if you want to put it that way rather than living on only by enslaving yourself by limiting one's choices. So, why does it seem like the will is weak in the face of temptation? Well, because if you do choose to lie rather than to die, what happens is that option disappears. The option to preserve rectitude goes away. You don't have that option because you don't have an upright will. You've started choosing the wrong things, and so you've shaped your affections in such a way that you're no longer inclined towards the good as such. So the next choice isn't a choice. It's just following along what, what your will gets you to. In that case, you can say, yeah, I didn't have a choice. I had no inclination whatsoever. I had no affection for dying. I had no affection whatsoever of allowing myself to be killed. Now, remember, the other way of saying that is I had no affection or no inclination whatsoever to doing the right thing. So this is why the will is, again, still capable of anything, of choosing anything, even if it takes options sort of off of its own table. So it's not that temptation is overcoming the will. It's that the will is enslaving itself to something. And again, he continues along here, uses another example here in, uh, in the next chapter, in 7. And I mentioned this. Uh, this is where he points out that, that the will is more powerful than temptation, right? The will is, what we would say, the will is immutable, right? It can't be compelled by some outside force. Even when it gives up the power to do the right thing, right? even when it enslaves itself. And the example he uses up here, so, quote, um, so the will, that is the instrument for willing, this is his argument for why it's always more powerful than temptation, even when it gives up. So, quote, Suppose you know a man who is so strong that if he restrains a wild bull, the bull can't move. So this is somebody who can like grab a bull and pin it. And you see him restraining a ram in such a way that the ram breaks free from his grasp. So a sheep, he's trying to hold a sheep and the sheep gets away. Will you think that he is less strong in restraining the ram than in restraining the bull? So is he suddenly weaker? Or how else would we explain this? Maybe, maybe the ram is a slippery little bastard, but uh, assuming that the ram is just not as strong as a bull, because if you've ever tried to hold a bull in place, you will have failed. Because I think he's like, he's, he has to be talking, talking about Hercules or something here. Because a single person holding a bull in place, that's, this is an over-exaggeration to say that this person is ridiculously strong. Uh -huh. Either he didn't try because he didn't take the sheep seriously, or uh, the consequences of not holding the bull were much greater. So something like that. Right? I think he leans more towards the former here, is that the strong person didn't apply his strength fully. Oh, what? Like the bull was about to kill him, maybe, and so he felt like he did 
Like yeah, so there might be a reason for it. Yeah, you ever done this? You ever done this in class? Yeah. You ever had a hard class and an easy class and do well in the hard class and not in the easy class? Yeah. You ever think, eh, you know, I, this this paper for this, you know, this gen ed um, philosophy of religion class, this will be easy, it'll be no problem. Oh God, I didn't do too well on this. Whereas, you know, your, your, your high level calculus class that's really difficult and you know that it's really difficult and you know that you're gonna have to put in all the effort you have in order to do well in it, you do great because you put in all the effort you have. Does that ever happen? This happened to me. Yeah, so that's what's going on here. That's the phenomenon he's pointing to. So he's pointing to this, this, this phenomenon where somebody can be really, really good at something but then choose not to apply themselves. Easy example. Right. So here we go. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna demonstrate my ability to do something. My ability to lift this coffee cup off the table. I did it. Aren't we proud? Yes. No. No. But <laughs> I did. I did. I lifted this off the table. I'm capable of lifting this off the table. Right. Easy. This is not something difficult. I could do it, any of you could do it. So if I put it back down, and you've probably seen me do this, because I've probably done this, oh, yeah. uh, I've probably done this in class, where I'm just walking by my cup of coffee, and I go to grab it, but I, I totally miss. <laughs> so you see me trying to do something that you know that I'm perfectly capable of doing, but I failed at it. What happened? You missed the yeah. So I wasn't paying attention. I didn't look. I didn't put in the effort. Right? Even though it doesn't take a lot of effort for me to lift the coffee cup off of the table, I can still put in less effort than I need. Right? So that's what he's pointing to here. He's pointing to the fact that, that someone can choose not to do something, even if it's easy. So I've used, I, we, we talked about this when we were talking about the problem of evil, that uh, if somebody can lift, say, 200 pounds, if they can bench press 200 pounds, they can also bench press 100 pounds. At the same time, it's perfectly possible for that person to not lift 100 pounds right? if they're not trying or if, they're, if they just don't choose to. So the will here is more powerful than temptation because temptation is like the ram. Right? The will is capable of, of choosing anything. So it's capable of making the hard choice. Even when the easier choice escapes it. Even if the easier choice gets away. I'm capable of lifting up, I'm capable of picking up the chair. Right? And this is slightly harder than picking up the coffee, the coffee cup. Right? And yet I can still fail to pick up the coffee cup if I either don't attempt it or I don't try hard enough or I don't pay attention or all sorts of other things. Okay. Now, to drive this point home even further, we get to this next bit. That not even God can take away rectitude of the will. Now remember, God, uh, Anselm perfectly well claims that God is omnipotent. God can do anything but he can't take away the rectitude of the will. And he's not saying that we are somehow more powerful than God. So what gives? Any thoughts as to why this might be the case? That God can't, that, well, can't, well temptation can't compel or enslave the will to sin. But let's make this even more extreme. Why can't God compel or enslave the will to sin. Any thoughts? We will. If he, if kind he of. could compel us and say, you know, if I'm talking to God right now and he says not go for your Star Wars cup, mm -hmm. then it wouldn't have been my choice to not go for your Star Wars cup. That's pretty good. So kind of. But he doesn't want to say that God can't just compel us to do things. Again, God creates the whole universe. God can create you So here we, we can go back to this distinction between natural and spontaneous. 
Right? So God can compel us, but that means that we're acting naturally. Right? So that's fine. That can happen. Right? So in that sense, God compels me to beat my heart. Right? What he's, what he's saying more specifically is God can't make me choose evil. Now, he'll get to, he will eventually show that, well, God also can't make me choose good, but... Actually choose good. Yeah, well, God can't make you do that. Okay. Why not? Any thoughts? Why can't God force me to choose evil? Yeah, it has a lot to do with this. So, let's go with uh, God wills that I will evil. All right, what does it mean for me to will evil? Yeah, so uh, here I'm choosing uh, something less than good. What does God will? So... Do we see the contradiction yet? And if he does, what, what then? Or, so he's either not God or. Kind of. So, So if God takes away rectitude from somebody, in other words, if God compels someone to will evil, well, willing good is to will God's will. To align one's will with what God wills, because God always wills the good. So if, I know that I'm using a lot of words really rapidly, um, but if, God's, if God wills the good necessarily, so that can either mean whatever good is, God always wills it, or whatever God wills is good. We'll get to that, because he does talk about this. So the distinction would be between um, God's, um, God's prescriptive will, so what God wills to do actively, and God's permissive will, so what God allows and allows creatures to do. There's a bit of a difference there, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to that, because uh, Anselm talks about it. Um, but here, this is a contradiction. Because if God wills you to do something, you're not sinning. You're doing what is good. Because you're doing what's in accord with God's will, and God's will is the fundamental structure of the universe. In other words, God's will is good by necessity. So if God compels you to will something, it's good. But who's to say, and the question is, why can't God compel or enslave the will? Mm -hmm. Why can't he compel or enslave the will to do good? So the question really specifically is, why can't God compel you to abandon rectitude of the will? Because Ansem kind of does think that God can compel you to choose the good, but then you can abandon it. I'm so, I'll think to you. So yeah. let's say God that makes sense. Uh -huh. to go outside and kill the nearest animal I see. Okay. And we can just assume for arguments like that, that animal is vital to the same thing as economic ecosystem. Yeah, kind of ecosystem. Thing. Okay. Does that just automatically make it so that squirrel deserves to die and this is good? Or is so, God has an ultimate plan or he wants to get away from this one squirrel being separate? So maybe something like that because it would, in order for it to be coherent at all for God to will that you go out and murder a squirrel murder using that kind of imprecisely, improperly, but fine. All right. God compels you, that God wills for you to go out and murder a squirrel. Great. No, he doesn't. God wills that you go out and kill a squirrel. 
And if you do it, it's not murder. It's not a bad thing because it's God's will. And God's will is necessarily good because those things are, they, they align. They're, they're roughly, they're not roughly, they're exactly the same thing. Because again, God's nature is the good. Because right? again, divine simplicity. All of the divine attributes are God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and now we can, we can, we can, we can, Shake that out in one of two ways. Either whatever God wills is good, or God only wills what is good. The, there's a bit of a question between those, and he doesn't clarify so much here. Uh, he does wind up clarifying in the third dialogue, so if you want to look ahead, there, there's that. Um, but the point is that if God wills it, it's, it's good. Right? Either just because God wouldn't will anything else, or because he makes it good in some way. So he can't will that you will against his will. Because if God wills that you do something against his will, then you're just following his will. And you're not doing something against his will. So, so we wind up with a really vicious circle here. So that's, that's why he wants to point out that no, not even God can force you to sin. So short version, the TLDR here is that, uh, yes, I belong on the internet. Um, <laughs> is everything, that's, everything you do that's bad is your fault. Everything you do that's good is God's fault. So we'll figure out exactly what he means by that as we go forward. Yeah, yeah, God gets all the credit. We get all the blame. That's how, wait, before you go, um, your final project plans, if you hand it to me,